Hey y'all, I thought I'd give you guys a lecture on Gilded Age, just kind of an overview because I feel like everything has been piecemeal, so um, this might be a little bit long, but if you want to, you know, watch it before the quiz, it's all good. So I think one thing is to examine the word of the Gilded Age. People call it the Gilded Age because it is kind of overlaid with uh, it's prosperity and progress, overlaid with poverty, racism, corruption, and financial instability. So, you know, if I had a little, I don't know, what are we going to put? A little dude, right? Let's see, I have a statue. I mean, I guild him, right? I'm going to cover him with gold. This does not mean he's 100% gold. He is just kind of covered in gold. And then if I scratch the surface, right, you can find out that it is not real gold. It is just kind of covered in gold. It just looks like it's gold. It's almost like you're appearing to be rich. So it's gilded with a G-I, not G-U-I. A lot of people kind of do this. And, I mean, no one's going to freak out on it in an essay, but gilded with, like, this is, like, the lollipop guild. Like, uh, I don't know, like a guild of sorcerers or something. You know, that is, like, a trade union. That is not what we're talking about. It is gilded as in covered with gold. The person who came up with this is Mark Twain. Um, yeah. So... You know, it's kind of examining all of the kind of problems of the Gilded Age. So that is just a little thing, right? So the first thing we talked about was the West, right? And one thing you can think about with the West is differing uh, visions, right? Individuals, corporations, minorities, immigrants, nativists, right? Um, but I think... One of the main things we also looked at is the railway, right? This is going to be a supporting fact for a lot of different questions, but how did the, you know, railroads get built was the U.S. gave what we usually call incentives, right? So this is not a government-run, right, system. If you ever go to Europe, right, we maybe would have been like, okay, well, here is a hub. Let's go here, here, here. This might have been a better, you know, use of track. This was not a, and then maybe like coming out here, 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 right? If I did like a centrally planned, you know, government run train, it might look a lot different. It might make a little bit more sense, but it would have been very expensive and it would have taken a long time to build. And you have to think, this was built at the same time as the Civil War. We do not have a lot of money but what we do have is a lot of land you know we just won the mexican-american war all this stuff so the united states government gives an incentive they're basically like we will give you land for every mile of railroad you make and so we give land the size of texas away to the railroads this is going to encourage western expansion as we have the railroad connecting east and west more people are going to move west um and it's also going to interconnect the economy but, um, yeah, so you can think about the government intervention in the West. You know, some people's lives who change is like the cowboys. The cowboys are kind of this classic Western idea. But really what they were were just workers who took the cows f from Texas or like the West, right? Here are the cows. They're kind of chilling out down here, right? And here is the railroads, right? And so cowboys literally took the cows on these trails to, right, the, uh, to the railroad. And then the railroad is taking these things to Chicago, right? And this is another part of, you know, the Gilded Age is that we no longer have, you know, little butchers, right? We don't have like neighborhood cows with neighborhood butchers. We have these Texas cows coming into Chicago. Um, cowboys are going to be these workers who take them there, right? And cowboys were very diverse. They, the, a lot of them were, the original cowboys were from Mexico. They were called vaqueros. And um, many African Americans are also working out west. But when they go to Chicago, they are going to be disassembled, right? It's going to be non-skilled. You no longer have a local butcher. You have, like, one swift assembly plant, plant that is going to, you know, take apart these cows, can them up, and use everything but the squeal. And the swift meatpacking companies 
owned the stockyards, they owned the refrigerated cars, they owned the canning company. This is a, an example of vertical integration. So corporations are one of the driving forces of the expansion west. They are using a lot of the resources. You know, we're going to also see mining companies. You usually have this classic thought that the west is these farmers, it is frontiersmen, it is these rough and tumble people, and that is true. I don't think anybody is more rough and tumble than this woman who is out in the middle of a, you know, field with, you know, cow patties. But the government also um, gave incentives for individual farmers to go west. They also handed them land. So what they did was they had the Homestead Act, which was 160 acres that was free. I'm putting that in air quotes for families who improved the land. So kind of two ways they encourage Western expansion. Both of them are through land incentives. One is for individual farmers with these Homestead Acts, and the other is with the Railroad Act. Mining also was one of the major forces in people moving west. We're not only going to find gold in California, but silver in Nevada, gold up in Montana. And a lot of times whenever we find this gold, the people that we are displacing more are going to be Native Americans. So, you know, as we were just moving straight west, it was not as much of a conflict. But when we start to settle into these mining towns, we get more conflict, especially here. This is where in the Black Hills, when we find gold here, this is when we're going to have a lot of Native American fights, um, like Custer's Last Stand and these other things. So this mining bonanza is going to really benefit corporations. Uh, they are the ones who are building these boom towns because when you have a major major mining uh, operation, it's not just like these little guys like, oh, I found gold, which might be the first guys who find it. But then you're going to set up, you know, this with like trains coming out and pumps and, you know, elevators. All of this stuff is investment. Um, so mining corporations are really the people who benefit. If you want to have this work, you have to have land, labor, and capital. Well, corporations were the ones raising the money, right, getting the capital. Uh, the United States was providing a lot of the land. And then there are kind of two places that people are going to be looking for uh, labor. But both of them are really, you know, immigrants. Um, in the West, where people look for labor, you know, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you're in the West, and I have a, I'm a mining corporation, or if I want to build the, the Transcontinental Railroad, it would take, before the Transcontinental Railroad, a very long time to get people to come from the East, right? But what was much easier was to get boats that were coming from China to go to California. So... Originally, we look to California, or we look to China for labor for the West. Um, we make a lot of treaties. It's called one of them is called like the Burlingame Treaty, and we actually want to have Chinese labor coming in to help, you know, build mines, to help, you know, build the railroads, um, and for general for labor. But then, as soon as they come in, um, a lot of the white labor that was there, you know, resents having these folks come in. Um, they're going to pass a mining tax. They're not going to allow them to testify in court. Um, essentially, they become non-citizens. And this all kind of escalates. This nativism, which is the word that you need to know, escalates until in 1882 we have the Chinese Exclusion Act, which allows no more Chinese immigration. We'll take a look more at that later. Um, so Native Americans were increasingly being put onto reservations. Um, and this is a long-standing policy of the United States. It's sort of like pushing people off their land. Pushing First, they're pushing people west of the Mississippi. Then they're pushing people onto reservations. And then they're making these reservations smaller and smaller and smaller. As folks move west, um, there are um, there is a Red Cloud War. And when they signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie... The United States creates this Great Sioux Reservation where they guarantee uh, these tribes that they could have this land. And if you take a look at it, it is, uh, you know, bigger than half of South Dakota. It goes into North Dakota, into Wyoming. And the United States basically promises um, 
that you will have this land as long as the water runs and the grasses grow. Um, I think we know where this is going. But if I have land, you know, the size of South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, all of these things, I still have a lot of land to, you know, hunt. So, you know, the kind of way with the Sioux where they would hunt, um, you know, the bison who would kind of migrate, you know, over the Great Plains. And so they could still migrate with the herds and teepees. They would be, you know, hunting bison. They still have their tribal way of life. They could still exist the way they had been existing for generations on the Great Sioux Reservation, right? This reservation was not the end of the world for the Sioux. So in this um, Great Sioux Reservation, they even were told that they could um, hunt outside of the Sioux Reservation. When they find gold in Montana, this is where we're going to get the Battle of Little Bighorn, where uh, when they find gold in, in um, South Dakota, there is a you know hunting party of Sioux that are out. Uh, Custer believes that he is kind of going into a village of women and children and men, and really what he's going into is a hunting party of all warriors. And so when he attacks, he doesn't think that he's going to get massacred, but he does. And this is an example where he loses the battle, but eventually the United States is going to win the war. Over time, what they are going to do, they're starting to find gold in other places. So first they found gold out here, and then they were like, okay, we have to shrink down your land to this reservation, right? No longer going into South Dakota or North Dakota, or um, yeah, no longer going into Montana. So they, they shrink it down to here. And then people could still, you know, migrate. This is still not the end of the world. And the big thing is they had their Black Hills, which was one of their holiest sites. But then, unfortunately, the United States finds gold in the Black Hills. And then this is by the time we get to later, by 1885, you know, there is a policy of assimilation. And that beginning of that assimilation is we're no longer going to have tribal land. We're going to give little tiny allotments of land to each Native American family, which gets rid of their whole tribal way of life. Um, and so what they do is they are going to give in the Dawes Act little tiny lots of land, which this whole idea of private property goes against their, their um, way of life and is assimilating them, and it's also reducing the amount of land, because if you gave each individual Native American a little plot of land, you can shrink down um, all of the other land. So essentially what they're doing with the Dawes Act is giving individual families private property, right? And then they're taking all of this tribal land because of course they found gold in their original Black Hills. A lot of Sioux say this is still illegal, they believe that they should be by the Great Sioux Reservation of the original treaty. Um, yeah. The other thing that folks are doing are basically making way for cattle. They are killing the bison, which migrate on these Great Plains. You know, they would eat the grass until it was, you know, down, and then they would move away. Then the grasses would grow back, and then by the time they grew back, they would be coming back. This is why the bison migrate, which is also why the Sioux migrated and around with them. But the United States government and railroad companies and corporations knew that if you, you know, killed off the bison, you would be killing off the Native American way of life. You would be forcing them onto the reservations. And so there was kind of this active incentives to kill off the buffalo during this time um, as well. So the other kind of way of assimilation, the Dawes Act was one of them without those allotments of land. But another one is... Um, you know, kill the Indian, save the man. This is a picture of Tom Tur Torino before and after the Carlisle boarding school, where they would just basically literally, you know, forbid them from speaking their language, punish them for, you know, acting in any sort of traditional way and reward them for, you know, assimilating into the American way of life. Um, again, this is the Dawes Act. This is allotment. This is assimilation in 1887, giving each Native American family 160 acres of land. So even when we talk about the West, we are talking about the rise of corporations because the rise of corporations is the kind of pillar 
of the Gilded Age. You start to have this huge inequality. It is what, you know, if you watch the, the movie, what built America. But this is the central part of um, the United States at the time. And if you look at the richest people in the United States ever, you know, today Jeff Bezos, Bezos, well, this was a while ago. I should check it out now. It was like $138.3 billion. Um, I'm sure he's worth way more now. But, um, yeah, it is nothing compared to Andrew Carnegie, which is worth $372 billion. He owned 2.1% of the U.S. GDP. Today, with the, like, pandemic, actually, people are saying Bezos is, is accumulating more because so many people are buying their stuff from Amazon. They're not going to stores anymore. So Bezos' is wealth is actually approaching more of Andrew Carnegie's today. Rockefeller, $342 billion. Uh, Mansa Musa, who... It was in Africa and controlled all the gold. It was worth more, according to this. And these are all weird. But anyway, just to kind of show you that if you look at any list of the richest people ever, a lot of them are Gilded Age folks. And so the big question is like, well, how did these people make so much money? Um, a lot of it is just kind of the time and their innovations. You know, uh, Vanderbilt's going to make his money on railroads. Rockefeller makes it on Standard Oil. And I think one thing that you have to know is that they do um innovate so like rockefeller did not waste a single thing with you know crude oil products he made i think he made like charcoal he actually invents gasoline so i mean he does do all i don't know if he invents gasoline but he makes it a major thing um you know and he is the person doing the refining of, of oil and carnegie is the one who went from rags to riches he um owns every step of the, the steel process. J.P. Morgan is going to be in investing and banking. <coughs> He's going to buy Carnegie Steel. Um, this is really where I wanted to get to. So there's kind of two major ways that people make a ton of money, and this is called vertical and horizontal integration. Um, if I'm a company and I buy other companies and I'm going to start to own them, so I would say this would be like if I'm a cell phone company today and I buy another cell phone company, another cell phone company, and another cell phone company until there is only one cell phone company, right? This is called horizontal integration. Standard Oil is the one that really did this. Usually they're going to kind of actually show Standard Oil. You can almost see where it's going as like a, you know, a uh, octopus, like, rah, like eating up all of the you know, other things with tentacles, right? That is a horizontal integration. And I think of it like oil is spreading out and like absorbing, right? Going horizontally. So oil is a good example of horizontal integration. Vertical integration, you know, when we look at the meat packing, when Swift or Armor, the, by the time they got the cattle to the time it made it to market, the cars that were on there, the wagons, the meat packing plants, the cool warehouse, the refrigerated cars, the slaughterhouse, it was owned by the same company. You never, you know, ever pay another dollar to another person. Um, another person who does this is, is uh, Carnegie Steel. And I also think of steel as being vertical, like you're building up, like you're building a building. So steel, you know, he owned the mine, he owned the trains, he owned the, uh, the process, right? So Carnegie Steel is another example of like vertical integration, as is the meatpacking plants. And I think today, if you look at something like Apple, who owns the Apple stores, you have the Apple, you know, headphones. They never want to pay another dollar to another um, company. That would be a good example of vertical integration. And I think also if you look at something like Disney, who is now getting into the Disney platform or the delivery, like they don't want to pay money to Netflix. Why don't they make money? Right. And so they're going to make their own, um, you know, TV, uh, provider. So these are, that is vertical. I never want to pay a dollar to another person. So yeah, here's standard oil. Often, like I said, this horizontal integration, uh, t taking up all the other oil companies, but also when you have these major corporations, one of the things you see is not only, you know, taking other oil companies in these kind of criticisms of Standard Oil. Uh, come on. It's also, right, taking over, I'll just leave it. It's also taking over the White House and Congress. You know, you have bribes. Anyone with so much money, you can just have outsized political influence. Okay. 
So income disparity is huge in the Gilded Age, and income disparity means the rich are rich and the poor are poor. We are actually worse off than we were in the Gilded Age. I think the main thing is is that we have a higher standard of living, so it's not like our poor. Well, some of them are. I can't say they aren't. But um, in general, the mass of poor folks are not, you know, living in gutters, poking dead horses, but um, we actually have a worse income disparity today, which is sad. So what is the political kind of side of this? And most of it is that the government should not do anything to interfere with these major corporations. Now, when I say that, most people say that it is laissez-faire or laissez-faire. It's hands-off. Let it be, right? Um, but as I say that, think about all the things the government does to support these big business. So we like to think of, you know, these captains of industry who built their businesses from nothing, but, you know, the government is giving them lands. The government is um, helping to um, give them subsidies. The government is protecting private property. If they are not paying their labor, if they are making billions or billions off of the backs of labor and then labor kind of rises up and wants to go on a strike, who is going to help the cor corporations is the government, right? They are going to send in the army. Um, and the other thing that the United States government is doing is they are actually making a tariff. Why don't we buy cheaper steel from other places? Well, because we have a tariff. Um, to protect our industries. You know, the courts and the system of laws are consistently during the Gilded Age siding on the side of corporations, right? They are saying the 14th Amendment protects um, corporations because they are individuals. This is the same time we are taking rights away from African Americans. Um, so yeah, because corporations are people, you can't take away their property. So sometimes when states would try to regulate railroads, the courts would say, you can't do that because corporations are people. So you have a sense, and many people kind of had a sense, that these corporations have an outsized power in Congress. Congress is just basically handing out to these major corporations. They're not giving labor or the little guy any sort of shake. Um... And mostly this is kind of a criticism of a lot of like the Republicans who are in Congress as well as the Democrats. Both political parties are corrupt. Um, and so when you take a look at like why are the rich so filthy rich and why are the poor so super poor? And most people say, well, it's because the poor people are not as good as the rich people. Um, you know, you can make it if you try. People look at someone like Carnegie and they're like, well, Carnegie was poor and he rose himself up. You know, there's a lot of popular culture that is saying, right, like, uh, I hate this, the name of this, but Horatio Alger wrote stories about a uh, ragged dick. And, you know, he talks about the scrappy young boy who, right, I'm a rough customer, but I won't steal. It's mean, right? So he's like really poor, but he's never going to steal. And then he like finds a uh, shoe polish and a gutter then he's like I'm gonna make a business out of this and then he's like polishing polishing someone's shoes and this guy's like you're industrious come work for me and then all of a sudden he's a billionaire I don't know so um these are popular culture this idea that in America you can make it if you try but the problem of monopoly for workers in general is that you know if I am now a steel worker, I am not a skilled worker. I am considered unskilled because of these corporations. And there is only one person who's making steel in all of America. I essentially have to take what this corporation gives me. And so there are unsafe conditions. They're working 12 hours a day. Uh, there are a lot of accidents. There is literally, there's kind of no competitions for people's labor. So, you know, as a teacher, if a hundred schools want me, you know, theoretically, that's probably a bad example. As a doctor, if 100 hospitals want me, I would be like, well, who's going to pay me more? And then you're going to go there. Competition for your labor is good because you can ask for better wages. If I'm desperate for a job and there's only one employer, then I can take whatever conditions and whatever pay they give me. So there is a problem where there's this idea where, you know, in this Gilded Age, the rich are just basically profiting off of the backs of labor. They are not paying them a fair wage. There are going to be unions that get together. So it's kind of like with big 
business becomes big labor, organized labor. A couple of ways that um, people are going to organize. One is a very general way through the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor were almost like a political union, like a progressive, or almost like a political party, like a very progressive political party. Um, what they called themselves a late, uh a union. This is inclusive. It includes women. It includes minorities. And their major goal was an eight-hour workday for everybody. So these folks were looking for broad, you know, changes that would help everybody out. The AFL is kind of what we traditionally think of as a union where you have skilled people asking for specific things for themselves and going on strikes. So, and this is called bread and butter unionism. So in the AFL, if I was a, I don't know, let's see, if I'm a teacher and I want better conditions for teachers, I would be asking for, say, less class sizes, you know, longer lunches, I don't know, right? I'm not trying to strike for an eight-hour day for, um, I don't know, McDonald's workers. I'm asking for better conditions for myself, um, and that is AFL, skilled people organizing around their skill for themselves. Um, and then you have a more radical sort of communist idea. The IWW is like the Wobblies. These guys want to kind of take out capitalism. They just want to have like, you know, worker run factories and these sort of things. So you do have strikes during this time. I think the big one we looked at in the movie was like the Homestead strike. Um, you know, there is also the Pullman strike. There is a, any number of strikes during the Gilded Age. Um, whenever there is a strike in the Gilded Age, someone is going to put it down with violence. Um, so, you know, the one we looked at, they had a private army called the Pinkertons, but in other times they would use the straight up army to put down some of these strikes. Um, one of which is like the railroad workers, um, because the government felt like they needed to, uh, you know, keep the economy going. So... One of the things that's going to change people's ideas about unions is the Haymarket Square. Um, I don't know. I guess you could think of it. I don't know. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, so in 1886, people are protesting for an eight-hour day. Um, and this was the Knights of Labor. And people are protesting. Someone threw a bomb. Um, and they are going to... Some police officers die. And then they're just going to go out and round up known anarchists, uh, usual suspects, and they're going to hang them. There's really no evidence that these are the folks who did it, um, but they are going to hang them. And this is what we call May Day for. So, you know, the, whole, the, the Haymarket Square kind of riot is going to give unions a bad name. Um, but there are strikes, there are riots, there is the Pullman strike where people, um, where the army is going to be sent in because, anyway, right? So you have strikes, you have different ways of dealing with it. Um, some people are like, we should just go into anarchy, just kind of blow the whole system up. But that would be very rad radical. So people just feel like, the workers feel like they are being pressed down by low wages and high rent. What? How are they going to respond with a strike? By organizing with a union, right? If you can just remember unions, remember at this time there are a lot of strikes, and that what is going to happen basically until the 1920s or, or, or until the 1900s is that, you know, the army is going to put it down in a very rough way. Um, so some other ways people think about, you know, how do you kind of excuse that the poor being so poor and the rich being so rich is social Darwinism. This is kind of survival of the fittest. People are poor because they are, they deserve it. Um, Carnegie is going to come up with this idea of the gospel of wealth. And what he's basically going to say is, you know, yes, he kind of believes in social Darwinism, but he also believes that the, it's the wealthiest job to give to the poor. Maybe not like feed them or, or give them money or, I guess, higher wages, but what you should do is give them a chance to, to rise up, right? And so he did a lot of money into libraries and these other things. So um, I never know really where to put this in the whole kind of system of the Gilded Age, but one of the main problems of the Gilded Age is corruption of the government. Um, and there's this weird event where a president is going to be assassinated by what people often call a disgruntled uh, office seeker. And so 
what would usually happen, and I, I, I put that in quotes because he was crazy, um, and essentially at the time, Republicans were trying to figure out how, if they wanted to reform or not. Some people who wanted to reform were called mugwumps, the other ones are called stalwarts, who basically like the spoil system. And the spoil system is, um, essentially when we get to the city boss system, it's like the city boss system, but on a national level. I support you, you support me. I give you money for your campaign, I get a job collecting taxes, I get a job collecting taxes, I don't, I can like, you know, grift, I could take off the top, right? So on a national level, you have a spoil system, which is very similar to like the city boss system. It's, I help you, you help me. Um, I help you get elected to president, you give me a sweet job in the government. And some people wanted to reform this, some people did not. Um, but Garfield actually um, was a president. He did not like the spoil system, but he was at the very first weeks of office, you know, bringing people in, giving people jobs. And uh, Guiteau comes in, he wants a job as an ambassador to France. This, this guy's literally crazy. If you know more about him, it's interesting. Um, and he doesn't get a job. He decides he's going to kill the president. He shoots him. The president goes down. He doesn't die till 11 weeks later, uh, basically of gangrene, because the doctors are like poking away at him with prods. His famous uh, defense, or well, one of his famous defenses, is that he didn't kill uh, Gitto, or he didn't kill Garfield. The doctors did, which is kind of true. Um, anyway, he is going to get killed. But when Garfield is essentially killed by a disgruntled office seeker, this is going to lead to the Pendle to the civil service reform. Um, yeah, other reforms that are made during this time is the Sherman Antitrust Act. And in the Sherman Antitrust Act, they essentially are trying to kind of restrain these monopolies. It is never really used to restrain monopolies up until Teddy Roosevelt, which we'll get to. Um, it's actually used to break up unions. So one answer to having these corrupt political parties, both the Democrats and the Republicans are handing out money to rich people, basically living off of patronage or the spoil system or the city boss system. The populists emerge as a third party because they feel like they are not being heard. None of the political parties are really like responding to them. And so what they do is they say, listen, we are in debt, right? And the problem with farmers is that the more they work, the worse off they are. I'm going to go out, I'm going to, you know, get a tractor, I'm going to invest in seed and more land. And when everyone in the United States does this, we have a lot of, say, I don't know, potatoes, right, or cotton, or anything else. And when you have a lot of cotton on the market, you are going to have lower prices. I don't know, think about like crawfish. If it's in season and crawfish are everywhere, and there are a lot of crawfish sellers, and then you go up to a crawfish market, and there are 10 people with like 100 pounds of crawfish, all wanting to sell it, and you look out, and you're the only buyer Essentially, the sellers are going to be like, hey, I'll give it to you for a dollar a pound. I'll give it to you for 50 cents a pound, right? They're practically giving it away. But if I walk in with a hundred other consumers and there's only one person selling crawfish, he's going to jack up his price, right? A, kind of like a lower supply is going to, you know, or, you know, more buyers are going to jack. Anyway, um, so if you have a lot on the market, it will actually decrease the price. Oh, sorry. Um... So these farmers are in trouble, they're in debt, um, you know, and they start to look at these monopolies, they start to look at the fact that these big businesses get rebates, they're getting handouts, but farmers are really not getting any handouts. So they're going to start by trying to have Granger laws, um, which try to regulate the railroads, um, and yeah. This is going to get curtailed by the national thing, but one of their big things that they hated was the gold standard. They took out debt when there was a lot of money in the system, when there was a lot of inflation. And what happens is when they make the gold standard, they deflate the money, which makes their debt feel like more. So while money is more valuable, debt is also more valuable. So by deflating the currency, they increase these people's debt kind of relatively. And so what these farmers wanted was they wanted more inflation. They wanted to put silver into the system. 
So the populist party emerges and probably the most famous phrase is we need to raise less corn and more hell. Um, they, they create a third party because they essentially are like, we can't farm our way out of this. If we farm more, we're just going to go into more debt. We need political change. So they create the, the populist party as a third party to challenge both the Republicans and the Democrats who are not listening to them. Um, yeah, we kind of went over that. We talked about the Wizard of Oz. Is it true? Um, in the election of 1892, as you can see, the populist party actually gets a lot of support in the West because that's where there's a lot of farmers. Um, but they do not get it in the South, and there are a lot of farmers in the South, but the farmers in the South are very dedicated to being Democrat because of Reconstruction um, and disenfranchisement of African Americans who are sharecroppers. But the, the populace do have a lot of land in the West. Um, there's another depression in 1893, which makes things worse. And then in 1896, you're going to have McKinley, who is a Democrat, who takes on the populist uh, banner. Uh, he is going to say, do not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. He is going to, um, yeah, this is what he's going to do. He is not going to win, but the Democrats now have more of the party of the populists. Um, and, you know, McKinley, who ran against him, gets all the money, the big money from, you know, these corporations, and he is going to win. Um, yeah, it's kind of like this first. Inequality of wealth is going to persist, right? Um, so immigration and cities are another major part of this. The new immigrants who are coming in are from Italy, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, many of them are Catholic and Jewish, and they are coming over in massive numbers at this time. And so when they are moving into these cities, there's a big question of what are they going to do with all of these folks? Where are they going to live? And when we look at where are they going to live, people start to build tenements, which are these buildings um, that are like multiple stories. And so, um, yeah, we'll just go over that later. Um, and what, as the cities are kind of filling up with, you know, new immigrants, what's happening is a lot of the middle class folks who used to live in the city are leaving. This is kind of the original white flight. They don't have cars at this time, but they they do have streetcars, and so people are starting to go into what they call like streetcar suburbs. So folks who are more affluent, if they can, they're leaving the city, and the cities are kind of filling up with more poor folks. And then you have a lot of problems with sanitation, you know, water pollution, disease, all of these things. And so folks are living in dire conditions with no ventilation and these horrible tenements, which are the buildings. And, um, you know, political machines are essentially going to be the governments of the cities and they emerge to meet the needs of these, these citizens um, and to, you know, create services. And so you have a large population of immigrants who need jobs. You also have to have services. And so what happens is these, these city bosses hire immigrants to, prov to build services, and then they get the votes of the immigrants to kind of do this. This is the political machine. I do a favor for you. You do a favor for me. It's called the political boss system, right, where the whole city is basically run like a mob where, you know, if you're in the system, you're all good. If you're outside of it, you're not. Um and there was also a political system, so you have the ward bosses, you have these, you know, city boss, and essentially, you know, like on voting day, these ward bosses, their job was to go out and just get uh, people to vote any way they could, sometimes through violence. Um, and so voting is one of the major things. There is a lot of, you know, one way to get votes is through graft by basically bribing people to vote for you or if your job is dependent on it. But the other thing is they would just straight up, you know, uh, have voting corruption where they would say vote early and vote often. They would drag people in multiple times. You know, they are the ones who count the votes, so therefore it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. Police would essentially, you know, I control the police. The police will make sure I vote the way I go. You know, one example of graft um, where you have corruption is a courthouse 
where it's estimated that it should have only cost like three million dollars it charged 13 million dollars to the city so essentially 10 million dollars was like handed out to different people for bribes um and Tweed is going to actually get uh, convicted of this. Thomas Nass is the one who really, you know, goes after him in different ways. Um, anyway, there are going to be some city regulations that are passed, some health codes, like you have to have one toilet for every 20 people. Um, but one of the people who's really going to be trying to target this the problem of tenements is Jacob Reese, who does How the Other Half Lives. And he is creating these pictures to essentially target, if he's saying how the other half lives, his target audience is going to be these affluent folks, folks in these like, you know, streetcar suburbs, you know, so that they see these folks not as like, you know, um, degenerates, but as someone you should help, someone who you should help reform. And he's pretty successful in that, creating um, that. Jane Adams, we will talk more about later. She is also a reformer. Um, but just know that there is a lot of nativist or anti-immigrant feeling that is happening during this time. Even before there was a lot of anti-Irish sentiment, um, you know, social Darwinism we already talked about, but it also kind of comes out as like scientific racism. Um, and you know, when we look at Irish folks at one point, they were not white, but eventually right? They are accepted into the city boss system. They are accepted into the Democratic Party. Um, and they become white. Um, and so the Irish are gaining more political rights as a white person, but other folks are not able to do that because, you know, we start to draw these very distinctive racial lines. So like African Americans are still not included. You know, we looked at a lot of the ways they're excluded before. Native Americans are being pushed into reservations. And, you know, Chinese American, basically what starts to happen is anyone who's of Asian descent is not allowed to come into uh, the United States. And so, you know, these racial distinctions solidified during this Gilded Age with scientific racism. Um, anyway, a lot of this I sort of repeated. Um, eventually what's also going to happen is we are going to start uh, reducing the amount of immigrants coming from southern and eastern Europe as well. Um, some folks looked at a show about Italian immigrants and some of the discrimination they faced. And so nativism is, 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 is strong throughout the United States. And what starts to happen is people are going to start restricting immigration uh, later. And I think we'll go over that more. But in, in a 1924, we have a quota act, and that's kind of what we're working towards. Well, I hope this was useful. Um, and that you do well on the quiz. Take care.